So as we've talked about before, the desert surrounding Egypt and the cataracts that were further south down the Nile had helped to protect it from outside invasion. That doesn't mean it didn't have contact with the rest of the world, though. The, the early Egyptians certainly had contact further south with the kingdom or the land of Nubia, as well as the Levant, that, that eastern area of the Mediterranean. And by the time we get to the Middle and Late Bronze Ages, Egypt very often was actually in control of these areas. We're going to talk about the expansion of Egyptian presence. And even when it didn't control those areas, at the very least, it often had outposts, colonial outposts, with military garrisons in Nubia and the Levant. But when we left off, Egypt was in disarray during that first intermediate period of 2181 to 2025 BCE. Now, during the first intermediate period, no marks, those regional governors that ruled over a gnome or what normally would have been like a city-state if it was independent as it was during the first intermediate period, those nomarchs ruled essentially independent kingdoms in the south. And during this period, there was one minor city that was really starting to come up, the city of Thebes. Now, the patron god of the city of Thebes was a god named Amun. You can see on the screen here, depicted as a man wearing two feathers. Now, Amun might have originally been the god of air, but during the Middle Kingdom, Amun is going to become not just the god of air, but the, the underlying substance of reality. And this type of god that's, that's not as tangible actually was given the epithet, the Hidden One. Well, in the 21st century BCE, the rulers of Thebes began conquering their neighbors. And by the time we get to around the year 2025 BCE, Mentuhotep II was able to conquer Lower Egypt, the northern portion of Egypt, once again reuniting the kingdom, beginning the next great age of Egypt, the Middle Kingdom. And with this, Egypt was back. But it had been in a civil war for about half a century, as Mentuhotep had been reconquering the other gnomes. Now, luckily, Mentuhotep II ruled for about 30 years that gave him time to solidify his power. He was really able to force the nobility to obey him. Though it's also worth remembering that nobility, the upper class, was no longer as dependent on the king to help get them into the afterlife. Because of the coffin texts, there was a stronger sense of independence. And so Mentuhotep II and his direct descendants were never able to fully re-legitimize kingship the same way it had been during the Old Kingdom where the king was seen as a necessity to achieving immortality. None of them were ever able to build any pyramids. They just built what we call mortuary temples or, or temples where priests would continue to take care of them after they died so that their spirit could still enter the afterlife and be maintained in the afterlife. These temples might have had little pyramids on top, but we're not sure. And it should be noted that while the capital was again moved back to Memphis, Mentuhotep II's his mortuary temple was in Thebes. These kings were not giving up their roots as being a Theban dynasty. And in this situation where the kings hold on power, what was less solid? In 1991 BCE, the royal family's representative in Thebes, and, and really the vizier of Egypt, the vizier is kind of like a prime minister, but their, their biggest official was the guy that ran the city of Thebes for them. Well, this vizier, Amun Emhat I, took power. We're not sure if it was a coup that took place, or maybe uh, there were no members of the royal family left, of, of Mentuhotep II's family left, and Amun Emhat I might have just filled in the power vacuum. But it's going to be him and his dynasty that really get the Middle Kingdom cooking. And it's worth noting that the name of Amun is in his name. We can see the importance of this god getting going during the Middle Kingdom. Amun-Emhat I ruled from 1991 to 1971 BCE. 
and he really was intent on bringing back the old kingly ways. As a matter of fact, during his rule, maybe later on, there was a prophecy that was discovered, the prophecy of Nefertiti, that supposedly came from the Old Kingdom, and it had prophesied that it would be him who would reunify the kingdom after a period of disunity. Now, there's no evidence that this prophecy was actually given during the Old Kingdom. This is something that helps to solidify his power. Remember, this is often how prophecy works. Very commonly will it pop up later in writing claiming to have actually been written decades, centuries beforehand. Amenemhat brought back pyramid building, though Middle Kingdom pyramids were way smaller than the ones from the Old Kingdom. They often only had mud brick as their core. This isn't necessarily because Middle Kingdom kings had less power, particularly after Amenemhat, but the military was now requiring more resources than it did during the Old Kingdom. As a matter of fact, the Middle Kingdom is the first time that Egypt is going to have a full-time, professional, standing army. That costs a lot more money than occasionally recruiting a militia to defend against any type of incursion. During the Middle Kingdom, expeditions were regularly sent out into the desert to locate oases around Egypt. And when they were located, garrisons of soldiers were left there to control them so they could regulate desert trade. Garrisons were also set up along the Way of Horus, this land route along the coast on the way to the Levant. Raids were regularly conducted into the Levant for slaves and to loot goods. And it needs to be noted that by the time we get to the 17th century BCE, we do have a new culture rising up in the Levant, often referred to as the Canaanite culture. We're going to talk more about the Canaanites later on. They're going to be really important, particularly by the time we get to the Iron Age. But one of the things you need to know is that the Israelites, a people who eventually are going to become the basis for Judaism and then Christianity and Islam, the Israelites are closely related to the Canaanites. As a matter of fact, they essentially are Canaanites that just break off and create their own culture. We're going to come back to that. But just remember that the Middle Kingdom, we're starting to see Egyptian influence on this newly forming culture. Now, the Egyptians didn't call them Canaanites. The, the name for the people living in the Levant at the time for the Egyptians were Amu. Amu is often translated as Asiatics. That is, they are from Asia, while Egypt is in Africa. And the Middle Kingdom pharaohs leave behind a lot of writings where they talk about how they went and slaughtered these Amu, or they took these Amu as slaves and brought them back into Egypt. And it wasn't just out in the desert and in the Levant that Egypt's military was getting active during this time. Egypt actually conquered part of the kingdom of Cush, which is actually in the land of Nubia. Now, even with all these military successes, Middle Kingdom pharaohs were never quite as unquestioned in their power as Old Kingdom pharaohs have been. As a matter of fact, Amun Emhat I was assassinated by a court official. His son did still take the throne, but this is pretty wild. And really, when it comes to domestic matters, you know, grand building and things like that, the Middle Kingdom was really a shadow of the Old Kingdom. But the military power and the imperialism of the Middle Kingdom was just the beginning of the grandeur of what Egypt will become in its role within the Middle East. During the Middle Kingdom, the democratization of the afterlife that we've talked about before continued through this period. Remember, this is the thing that starts off with the coffin texts, where the nobility during the first intermediate period had the ability to access the afterlife on their own, using those spells and directions that were painted on coffins. But during the Middle Kingdom, more tradesmen were able to be mummified and receive coffin texts. This is also a period that we see the first glimpses of personal piety. Personal piety is just the idea of having a personal relationship with a single God. 
we see in a lot of the tombs of aristocrats writings that indicate that they had an emotional connection with a single God, believing that single God was looking out for them, that if they acted the right way, they would receive the blessings of that single God. This is incredibly important because if we think about modern religion, where people have an emotional connection with their God, that wasn't the common experience, particularly if we're talking about like the early Bronze Age, but we're seeing starting to see that rise up in Egypt. And again, it is going to go on to affect other areas, particularly the Levant, Canaan. Just as over in Mesopotamia during the Middle Bronze Age, we start to see wisdom literature becoming more common. Remember, wisdom literature are teachings, writings on how to live a more moral life, on how to live a good life. One of the wisdom texts that we have pop up during this period actually has a discussion, the world's first written discussion that we have on the morality of suicide. It is also during the Middle Kingdom that we see pharaohs creating scribal schools in order to expand their scribal class. They needed more educated people who could read and write and represent them throughout the kingdom. You can see why the Middle Kingdom didn't have as big of pyramids. They're spending money on a lot of other large personnel projects, bureaucracy in the scribal schools, and of course, the military, the standing military. Scribes were important because in a lot of ways, they were the middle point between the high government and the common folk. So scribes would be based in all the cities throughout Egypt. And so if the king gives out a command, it has to be copied back at the royal palace. It has to be sent out to all the cities. And then the scribes that are based in those cities read out whatever these new commands or taxes or laws would be to all the people there. They, you can almost think of them as like mayors and town councils. Not that they had power in that way. They were the communicators of what came above, but they're also the only ones that can read so everybody in the town has to take their word that they are doing things or they are saying things that are true, that truly came from the king or from the nobility. They are also the ones that actually write out the tax ledgers, decide how much each person owes, how much they have to pay. And they're the ones that write up and enforce contracts. This is a class of people that need to be trusted and need to be trustworthy. And so it's also during the Middle Kingdom that we start to see explicit moral codes being created by the scribal class. Remember, nobility and kings, they don't have to have a moral code. They, they might individually have certain desires, but they can do what they want. Scribes have a very specific job they need to do, and, and the people underneath them can't enforce anything upon them. And the nobility and, and the royalty are usually far away. If they don't have a moral center, the whole thing falls apart. And so we get these moral codes where scribes are expecting each other to maintain a sense of ma'at, a sense of order. And this is where we really begin the idea of religious morality. Think of how religion has been up to this point. You know, the gods don't necessarily always do the right thing. Everything is governed by impulse. A god wants to kill somebody, they kill somebody. Think of like the Epic of Gilgamesh and the flood myth within it. Gods kill people maybe because they're just annoyed, maybe because they just get in the mood. And if the gods act that way, why would people act any different? The scribes of Egypt are starting to create a sense of, no, you don't lie just because it's wrong to lie, even if you have an impulse to do so we actually get what's often referred to as the 42 precepts of Ma'at that include very specific commands like, thou shall not murder, thou shall not steal. Remember this when we get to the Israelites and the creation of things like the Ten Commandments, which is going to be coming much later. The Middle Kingdom also saw the very first woman pharaoh, Sobek Neferu, who ruled from around 1806 to 1802 BCE. There had been women regents beforehand, women that ruled the kingdom for their sons or for their disabled husbands. Sobek Neferu is the very first woman who just rules outright on her own. She is a pharaoh. 
Now, by the time we get to the 17th century BCE, the 1600s, the kings of the Middle Kingdom were starting to lose their power. 1650, or around the year 1650, is what we often refer to as the beginning of the Second Intermediate Period, because the kings of Egypt essentially lost control over the north and the south. Cush not only took back the land that had been conquered, Cush was able to conquer part of the southern set section of Egypt, and in the north, a brand new group invaded and took control of the delta. As the kings were losing power during the 17th century BCE, and they were no longer able to maintain large scribal schools or a large military, they stopped manning the garrisons along the way of Horus. Again, that area that connected the Levant and Egypt. If you were going to invade from the Levant, you would go along the way of Horus. Well, if you abandon all the garrisons there, that opens up Egypt for invasion. As I said before, there were already plenty of Amu, or Canaanites, who were living in Lower Egypt, in Northern Egypt. And it seems that a lot of these Canaanites had actually set up homes in the city of Avaris. Again, some of these Canaanites were slaves, but there were Canaanites who just moved there, sometimes because there was famine in Canaan, and so there was food that was available in Egypt if you could go get a job. Some of them, because they were merchants, and so you'd have family members that stayed in Canaan, and then part of the family set up a, a merchant house in the city of Avaris, so they could send things to their family members, and then the, the, the family living in Avaris could sell that to the rest of the Egyptians around them. So there's already a connection there. And as royal power was weakening, there's some hints that some of these Canaanites, some of these Amu who were living in the city of Avaris, might have been starting to rise up to try to take power for themselves. Certainly, around the year 1650, invaders from Canaan came in and took over the city of Avaris and the surrounding lands. They may have been coming in to help out the Amu, the Canaanites who were already living there, they may have just been coming on their own to take advantage of a unstable situation. These new invaders, they came with a new technology that was just becoming all the rage in the Middle East, chariots. They had probably learned this technology from the Indo-European Hittites. The Indo-Europeans were the ones who first invented the chariot. Along with chariots, they were also using composite bows much more powerful than the simple bows that were being used by the Egyptians. They set up a kingdom in the north of Egypt, in lower Egypt, in the delta. The Egyptians called them the Hyksos. And these Hyksos adopted as their patron god, the god Set. You might remember this guy, the guy that had killed his brother Osiris. Set had long been the god of the desert. He had been the god of storms. Probably around this time, he's becoming the god of foreigners, possibly the Canaanites that had moved to Avaris before the Hyksos had adopted him as their patron god. And as the god of storms, he would have been very similar to a very powerful god in the Levant, Baal Hadad, or Baal Hadad, the god of storms for the Canaanites. This is very common in the ancient world, where the god of rain in one area was easily connected with the god of rain in another area. Same god, different names is how people would often think about it. And it should be noted that all this is taking about a half century before the fall of Babylon, before the Hittites destroyed Babylon. And so we're really talking about the second intermediate period is in Egypt, the transition from the Middle to the Late Bronze Age. Now, the first intermediate period of Egypt was a period of small independent states up and down the Nile. The second intermediate period of Egypt from around 1650 to around 1550 BCE really was made up of three states. The Hyksos in the north, the Egyptians being ruled from Thebes in the center. That city of Thebes never stopped being important. And the kingdom of Cush ruling in the south. We don't really know much else about this period, but the main thing to remember is that the ties between Egypt and Canaan were growing deeper and deeper, and that the Canaanites themselves were Semitic speakers. They were related to people like the Akkadians and the Babylonians. But as they were adopting more and more Egyptian culture, 
what we get in the Levant and with the Hyksos is a mixture of these two great power centers of Egypt and Mesopotamia. Remember this when we get to the Iron Age. The Levant is where that Semitic culture that we're very familiar with in Mesopotamia is blending with this Egyptian culture. This Egyptian culture that includes things like personal piety, is developing things like rules, moral rules for scribes. And of course, during this period, the Egyptians learned from the Hyksos. They adopted the chariot and they adopted the composite bow technology, making their military even more powerful. Sometime around the year 1550 BCE, the king of Thebes, Achmos I, began his reconquering of Egypt. And by the end of his reign in 1525 BCE, he had put the kingdom back together. But unlike the Middle Kingdom that was trying so hard to be like the Old Kingdom of Egypt, the New Kingdom, this new kingdom that Achmos I is creating, is going to be much more forward-looking. One example of how the New Kingdom was not trying to replicate the Old Kingdom was where it located its capital. The New Kingdom pharaohs still used Memphis from time to time, but Thebes is going to be maintained as their primary power base. The Theban god Amun became the primary god of Egypt during this time. He was comboed up with the old chief god Ra in order to solidify his supremacy. And so Amun-Ra was not just the god of air, is now also the god of, of the sun, and the god of the underlying substance of reality. This is far more powerful, or far more above, far more different from any other god that Egypt had had beforehand. And what we're going to see throughout the New Kingdom is that Amun-Ra is going to become the very clear top god. As a matter of fact, other gods often are going to be seen as emanations or avatars of this Amun-Ra. It's not quite monotheistic, but it's moving that direction. Probably the only thing that the New Kingdom pharaohs were really trying to reach back to in terms of going back to the Old Kingdom was they were really wanting to reassert the same semi-divinity the Old Kingdom pharaohs had. And so New Kingdom pharaohs start calling themselves Son of God or Son of Amun-Ra. And in order to make this claim, they started making their mothers, sometimes their sisters or their wives, the official wives of the god Amun. Now, the main temple precinct or the main temple district in the city of Thebes was called Karnak. And in Karnak, there, there are temples to several gods, but New Kingdom kings really built up the temple to Amun, to Amun-Ra. There, there was a synergy that was being created. That, that should remind us a little bit of the same synergy between the priesthood of Ra and the kings of the Old King. The priests of Amun gave the kings of Egypt during the New Kingdom legitimacy. They provided PR. They held the king up as a semi-divine figure very closely connected to their god. And as they did so, in order to return the favor, to keep everybody on the same page, the pharaohs of the New Kingdom regularly would donate land, donate wealth, to the Amun priesthood. And over time, the, the priesthood of Amun became incredibly wealthy. As we're going to see, eventually, possibly more wealthy than the pharaohs. And when we're talking about power, we're really talking about wealth, even if you think in the modern day. Money is just power. The high priest of Amun was referred to as the first prophet of Amun. And there was actually different ranks. So there was the second prophet, the third prophet of Amun. This first prophet of Amun was seen as second in power only to the king. No other priesthood came close to the wealth or power of the priesthood of Amun, Except one, kind of, and that is the god's wife of Amun, another priesthood. Remember, th this is how the kings were able to officially say that they were the sons of Amun, the son of God. This priesthood, the god's wife of Amun, was held by the mother or the wife or the sister of New Kingdom pharaohs. They were given control of lands that, were, that often belonged to the second prophet of Amun. And... It should be noted during the New Kingdom, 
women in the royal family were exceptionally powerful. Again, power and land ownership, wealth, have always been intertwined. Now, there was no pyramid building during the New Kingdom. Much more money was put into very huge mortuary temples and, of course, into conquest. The Egyptian Empire is going to hit its peak in terms of power and land area during the New Kingdom. And rather than building pyramids near Memphis, New Kingdom pharaohs regularly built new burial complexes, new tombs, and mortuary temples near their capital of Thebes. You might remember that proto and early dynasty kings were often buried near Abydos, that city near that crook in the, the, the Nile that's actually pretty close to Thebes. And during the Old Kingdom and the Middle Kingdom, they were sometimes buried near Abydos or near Memphis. Of course, the Plain of Giza, where the most famous pyramids are, is very close to Memphis. But even then, the Old and Middle Kingdom kings usually had a funerary temple at Abydos, even if they were buried near Memphis. Well, during the New Kingdom, pharaohs were always buried near Thebes, in an area that's been called in the modern day, the Valley of the Kings. Interesting little fact here is that the highest peak near this valley uh, is a mountain called El Gurn. As you can see here, El Gurn looks a little bit like a pyramid. Now, early in the New Kingdom, the way of Horus was firmly secured by the pharaohs. And by the time we get to around 1500 BCE, pharaohs were personally leading conquests into the Levant. Early on, some of them made it all the way up to the Euphrates, made it all the way to the edge of Mesopotamia. And in this area, local rulers were no match for Egypt. There were a couple large kingdoms that Egypt had to contest with, the new Hittite Empire and a kingdom called Mitanni. We're going to talk about more of those later on. But mostly, Egypt had just had to deal with small petty kings that ruled over a single city-state or a few city-states. One of the main goals of these conquests was to control the Lebanese cedar forests. These areas had the only really good timber in all of the Middle East. These are the same ones that Gilgamesh had supposedly stolen wood from. And just like the Sumerians, the Egyptians saw these forests as a mystical land. It's a lot easier to make something mystical when it's far away and has something that you don't have at home an area where the gods might be living. And just to be clear, when Egypt conquered these lands, just like many other conquerors of the past, they left the local kings in place. As long as these kings swore fealty to the Pharaoh of Egypt, sent taxes, sent levies whenever requested, they were still left to manage their cities or their, their small territories. Though Egyptian garrisons were regularly left behind, and of course, Egyptian officials, scribes were left to help supervise these these petty kings throughout the late bronze age the main great rivalry uh particularly in the levant was between egypt and the kingdom of new hadi or the new hittite empire kush however was a totally different story in the 15th century egypt completely conquered it and Egypt set up their own viziers, their own major ministers, to govern it for the pharaoh. So as we can see, Egypt is at peak power during the New Kingdom. And one of the most successful rulers of this era was Egypt's second woman pharaoh. Originally, she had been made regent for her son, Thutmose III. He is going to follow her eventually, and a lot of people would make the argument that he was the most powerful pharaoh of Egypt. But whatever success he had, he was building off what his mother Hatshepsut had done. We're not totally sure how she initially was able to take the kingship for herself. Like I said, she was set up as a regent for her underage son, but within seven years, she had claimed kingship for herself. This might have been a little bit by little bit, just accruing power, getting more and more nobility and scribes to support her. It may have been an instantaneous coup. We just don't have records yet. We haven't discovered any records of it yet. Part of Hatshepsut's power came from her position as God's wife of Amun. Remember, this, this came with 
tons of wealth that allowed her to pay off people, allowed her to buy resources as necessary. It also came with the training to understand religious rituals and the religious establishment as a whole, a huge part of the power base in Egypt. Hatshepsut will eventually claim to have received prophecy when she was younger that she would someday inherit the throne. She also claimed that her father had always wanted her to co-rule with her stepson. No matter what, we know that she certainly secured support when she was at court, maybe through bribes, maybe through promotions, and it seems that she was truly liked and looked at as an exceptional leader by the nobility and scribal class of this period. It's also worth pointing out that she never killed Tutmos III. She let him do as he wished, and, and so this doesn't feel like a coup. It is totally possible that she took power because she was trying to protect him from another branch of the family that saw an opportunity when he was underage to possibly take power for themselves. And so by making herself Pharaoh, she was able to solidify her branch of the family line. Now, Hatshepsut was incredibly successful when it came to foreign affairs. She personally led campaigns into Syria and even deeper into Nubia. Most famously, she sent an expedition to the land of Punt. This land of Punt was where lots of religious necessities came from. It's, it's where Egypt got its incense. It's where it got its leopard and tiger skins that were often worn by priests during ceremonies. It's where it got its electrum, an alloy of silver and gold that was used to do things like cap pyramids or create religious clothing. Like Lebanon, Punt was seen as a mystical land. It's actually often referred to as, quote, God's land, or Amun's garden. And by sending an expedition there, she secured tons of wealth and religious necessities while bypassing all the middlemen that Egypt usually had to go through. Apparently, she was pretty good with domestic issues as well. Lots of noble tombs actually put her name in them. She built the tallest obelisks in the world at Karnak, two 100-footers. And she had her mortuary temple built on the other side of the mountains from the Valley of Kings, though she was still buried in the valley itself. She built it right next to Mentu Hotep's, except for hers was even bigger and more elaborate. It is lined with statues of Osiris, but with Hatshepsut's face in the place of Osiris's face. It had multiple chapels for different gods, including an open-air altar to Ra Harakti at the top level. Ra Harakti, this is essentially Horus Ra, and a shrine to Amun in its deepest point. This is one of Egypt's largest monuments ever, and it shows that Hatshepsut was, again, incredibly powerful. But later pharaohs, probably Tutmos III, erased her name and her likeness as much as they could. More than likely, having once had such a powerful female pharaoh in charge made them feel weak or made them feel that their manhood or that their place in society was being undercut. And again, it's, it's worth remembering, patriarchy hurts everybody. Obviously hurt part of Hatshepsut's legacy, it also created a situation where super powerful pharaohs like Tutmos III felt inadequate simply because of the existence of a successful woman pharaoh. Even though Egyptian women were freer than their Mesopotamian counterparts, even though New Kingdom noble and royal women could hold some power and hold wealth, most of the men, even in Egypt, again, most noble and royal men, really were focused on the idea that they always needed to be a level up. In our final lecture on Egypt, we are going to see one exception to this, or one possible exception. A royal couple, Akhenaten and Nefertiti, the, the parents of King Tut, if you've ever heard of him, might have actually ruled as equals, or at least something close to equals. But that's in the next lecture.